Welcome to all of you here today. We have lots of guests on this special day, Easter Sunday, the day the world recognizes that Jesus was raised again from the dead. We don't know the exact date, numerical date on the calendar, but we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was raised on a Sunday morning, and we know for a fact, because it coincides with the Jewish feast of Passover, we know for a fact it was about this time of year. And so we appreciate all of you being here today. We're here to honor Jesus. That's the songs we have sung about. He who has won a great victory for those who put their faith and trust in him. He has overcome death. He has overcome the grave. And that gives us great hope, those of us who are Christians. If this is your first time here, and maybe you have been... Maybe you've been turned off by church in general for some reason. To, to be quite honest with you, I, I sometimes don't blame you by the way that some churches treat people. We had a welcome time with coffee and donuts and juice and all that today. The purpose of that is to, to we don't want you to be uptight when you come to church. We want you to feel welcome here. And we are not a church, I want to assure you, uh, because some of you probably in the back of your mind, maybe because this is what's happened before, maybe you think, okay, let's, you know, let me dig in here. The preacher's about to beat us up. I'm not a preacher who beats people up, and this is not a church that beats people up. We're a church, and I'm a preacher who tries hard to build people up. So we're glad that you're here today. And if you are thinking also, well, I've got to put on, you know, all my, my best front and all that because I've got to be perfect to come to church. We actually have it backwards when we think that way. There is not a single perfect person here, beginning with me, and I'm sure my church would say, Amen, real loud to that. Your preacher is not perfect. There's nobody here who is perfect. And so you don't have to be perfect to come here. I mean, join the rest of us. We're all imperfect. But the Bible teaches real plainly, despite our imperfections, when we put our faith and trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross and his resurrection, when we do that, God counts us like we're perfect. That is what the good news is. Let me just give you a, an illustration of just how imperfect churches can be. Uh, I gave some of these a couple of weeks ago at a regular service here, but these are actual bloopers from church bulletins in whatever type of church across the country. You're going to think he's making that up. I'm not making any of this up. These were actually printed in church bulletins. This shows you how imperfect churches can be. Here's what. This afternoon, there's going to be a meeting in the south and the north ends of the church. People will be baptized at both ends. <laughs> it kind of sounds odd, doesn't it? Here's another one. This being Easter Sunday, we're going to ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> I would have liked to have been there for that. How about this one? Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She's also having trouble sleeping, and she requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> that cuts me deep. One more. This is the worst one, I think. Today will be our preacher's farewell message, after which our choir will sing, Break Forth into Joy. <laughs> well, we're very happy to have you all here today on this very special day, this Easter Sunday. And uh, I want you to know we're in the middle of a sermon series called God and the Problem of Evil. And I'm going to address that today, but I'm going to speak to it specifically as it relates to the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And you'll plainly see where I'm going this with this here in just a few minutes. But this is the number one question that all people have. People who have faith, people who don't have faith or people who once had faith and now are leaving their faith. The main reason, number one reason when people are polled is because of this. If there's really a God, then how come all this bad pain and suffering and evil and tragedy happens down here? And if he's there, but if he's really powerful, why doesn't he do anything about it? And if he doesn't do anything about it and he's really there, then that makes me not want to have anything to do with him. This is the number one question that people have. And to kind of just give you a summary of what we've seen in the past several weeks, we've seen this. The biblical writers, 
If you're not familiar with the Bible, let me give you a quick synopsis of all 66 books. From Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, to the last book of the Bible called Revelation, and everything in between, all of the biblical writers assume that there is a big cosmic conflict that is going on between evil beings and good beings, and the earth is caught in the crosshairs of this cosmic conflict. You see this language of this warfare all throughout Scripture. And any time that you and I, living in a modern world, in a modern uh, mindset, scientific approach, any time we hear talk about, you know, the spirit world and evil beings and real beings and those kind of another unseen world, any time we hear talk about that, we automatically are very suspicious of that. And the reason we are suspicious of that is because of this. Everybody in here, if you graduated from high school or went to college, you've heard of this. We are all products of the time period in which we happen to live. Everybody is. And you and I in this room, living in a modern Western culture, we are products of a movement, a way of thinking, a philosophy, a mindset that happened in Europe in the 16 and 1700s called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, they call it that because this was a time when they were coming out of the Dark Ages. We've all heard of that. And the Dark Ages was a time when, when learning was suppressed, when there wasn't a whole bunch, bunch of discovery, when there wasn't much learning and invention and that kind of thing going on. So it was a dark time. And so coming out of that during the 16 and 1700s in Western Europe was the Enlightenment. Lots of discoveries were being made. Lots of inventions were being made that allowed us to discover our world and see it in a way that we had never seen it before. And because of that, and because we are a modern Western country, we are products of this kind of thinking. And so the way that you and I think, most of us, is we want to evaluate everything by the scientific method. And if we can't see it, and if we can't feel it, and experiment with it scientifically, we're automatically kind of suspicious of it. And the strange thing about that is, we may not know this, but this is true. You can go check me out on this, and I hope you will. Virtually all cultures who have ever existed before our culture and contemporary with our culture right now, basically all cultures who have ever existed who are not products of the environment, all of them assume and know and believe, yes, there's a real world that's an unseen world. There are real beings that we can't see. There are good beings and evil beings. It is our culture, our modern Western Enlightenment culture, that is out of step with the rest of humanity currently and all cultures that have ever existed. Very, very important. And so what we want to ask today, here's what I'm going to address this morning. Why doesn't God do something about evil and pain and suffering? I mean, it's obvious it happens. Um, most of our church is familiar with the fact. Some longtime members that were here recently, their daughter, Jenny, this is Stephen ben Brenda Payne. She used to be the high school tennis coach. Their daughter, Jenny, 32-year-old young lady, was engaged to a man. They were about to be married in three weeks. And last weekend, they were in a tragic automobile accident. It killed her fiancé. She was in the hospital, had to have some surgery. She's out of the hospital and doing much better now. But instead of finishing the final preparations for their wedding, she had to attend his funeral on Friday. If God's really God, if he's really there, if he really cares, if he's really powerful, then why doesn't he do something about all this kind of stuff that has always happened throughout all of human history? Well, he has. He has done something about it. That's what the cross and the resurrection was all about. And I know probably what you're thinking. I'm going to unpack this throughout the sermon. You're probably thinking, well, evil and pain and suffering hasn't stopped. You're right. It hasn't stopped right now. But this was the nail in the coffin. It was kind of like the cross and resurrection of Jesus was the D-Day. That's when God invaded planet Earth and began to take it back for his own purposes. Like at D-Day in World War II. D-Day was June the 6th, 1944, as most of you know. That was not the end of World War II. There was more fighting and suffering and pain after that, wasn't there? But on that invasion... When American and other allied forces crossed the English Channel and invaded France and Europe and began to take it back from Nazi Germany control, on that day, for all effective purposes, that war was over. 
That was the beginning of the end. Even though there was more fighting to come. And that's what happened at the death and resurrection of Jesus. That was the D-Day. That was the day. The fighting is still not over. The suffering and the pain is still not over. But the final outcome has been determined. And so I hope you'll follow with me today. We're going to look plainly at the death and resurrection of Jesus in probably a way that you've never looked at it before. But I'm going to show you plainly from these scriptures. We've kind of missed some stuff that's in there. We've kind of read over what it says. This verse in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, We know that we're children of God. The whole world around us is under the control of the evil one. You want to know why so much bad stuff happens down here? This is the reason. We have been laying the blame at the wrong doorstep. God is not causing it. Who causes it? Free will beings, both human beings and evil spiritual beings that we can't see, they cause pain and suffering in the world. And as this verse says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one, which is why it looks like it. You want to know why it, look, it seems to be that the world's full of so much evil? The reason it seems that way is because it is that way. Because the whole world is under the control of the evil one. It's that way temporarily. But Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection signaled the end of this. Jesus said it this way in John 12. He said, the time for judging this world has come. It's come right now in his lifetime. When Satan, who's the ruler of this world, he's going to be cast out. I want you to remember that little phrase, cast out. Because there's a verse that I'm going to show towards the end of this sermon that I'm going to, it's going to use some of the same language. And he's referring to the fact, he's referring to the fact that when he is lifted up from the earth, that's when I'm going to draw everyone to myself. He's referring to his crucifixion. When he was lifted up from the earth on the cross, at that point, Satan was cast out, meaning that was his end. That was his real demise. That was when he was defeated. That was the D-Day. There's still more pain and more suffering to come, which we all experience. But that sounded the final defeat of Satan. And then look at this verse in 1 John. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. If you are ever unclear about why Jesus came, there are several verses throughout Scripture that say Jesus came for this and Jesus came for that. This one says, here's why he came, to destroy the works of the devil. You see, what was going on on the cross was a lot more extensive and pervasive than just the benefits of salvation that we reap from it. There was a lot more going on there than just what we see in our relatively small lives and our relatively small corner of the universe. Jesus defeated Satan and all this cosmic host of evil enemies at the cross. That was what was going on at the cross. And I'm going to bring up some verses in Colossians especially and a few others scattered here and there. But I'm going to show this plainly about what happened at the cross was a defeat of Jesus' ancient arch enemy, Satan and all these evil beings. And as a result of that, we have salvation. Look at this verse in Colossians. He says, may, may you be filled with joy, giving thanks to the Father. Now listen to this language. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Now let me stop right there for a second. There is not a single person in this room or in any church service throughout the world this morning or anywhere else. There is not a single person who because of what is inherent within them is qualified to live with God forever. None of us are qualified to live with God forever. Our church hears me say this all the time. If we all got what we deserved, where would we end up? We would all end up in hell. That is what we deserve. I'm not qualified to live with God forever, and neither are you, because our sin separates us from God. But this verse says, you can be qualified. God can qualify you to share in this inheritance of eternal life. And then look what he goes on to say. He has rescued us. But notice what it says he rescued us from. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. That's the kingdom that Satan presides over. And he transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he purchased our freedom. What did he purchase our freedom from? He purchased our freedom from Satan and from the evil tyranny that he held over our lives. That's what he purchased our freedom from. Look at this verse in Colossians. He canceled the record of charges against us. 
And he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, notice what it says he did. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. And he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Paul, an inspired apostle, says in plain language right here, what was going on at the cross was much more extensive than what you and I experience in our personal salvation. He defeated Satan. He defeated all of these spiritual rulers and authorities. He had victory over them, it says, on the cross. And only because of his victory over them, only because of that, do we have victory over, over sin and over Satan and over all the tyrannical things that he was keeping us enslaved to. And so when you think of the cross, most of us when we think of the cross, we think of, and rightfully so, partially, we think of the fact that we get forgiveness of sins. We get counted as righteous. We have an opportunity now to live with God forever. And all that is true. But that's not all that was going on there. It's such a bigger scope than that. Look at what this verse says in Hebrews. Since the children have flesh and blood, that means since normal people like you and I, since we have flesh and blood, he too, talking about Jesus, shared in their humanity. He became a person. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free all those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. See, what Jesus did on the cross is, it says plainly right there, he broke the power of Satan. There's a lot more going on there than simply purchasing our salvation. First, he had to break the power of Satan who held us in slavery throughout all of our lives to the fear of death. Because if you think about it, Here's one thing I know for certain. Uh, I, I'm a preacher who doesn't have all knowledge. I don't know everything. I don't know everything that's going to happen, but I am 100% certain of what I'm about to say. The last time I checked, the death rate for human beings was still universally holding at 100%. No matter which continent you live on, no matter which culture you live in, whether you're man and woman, it's 100%. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, every single person in this room, within a hundred years, will be dead. And will be in eternity somewhere. And I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying it to say that Jesus has given us a way out. He has purchased our freedom so that Satan no longer can tyrannize us by the fear of death. Because if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, and without Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection, death means you die and go to hell. Because sin separates you from the Lord and all of us sin. But with Jesus' death and resurrection, He has freed us from that. We don't have to be afraid of what happens when we die anymore. Amen. And what we were afraid of was Satan. And here's what Satan does. This verse in the Old Testament says, The angel showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. They're in the Lord's presence. And the accuser, that's what Satan's name means. He's the accuser. The accuser was there at the angel's right hand in the Lord's presence and he was making accusations against Joshua. Here is what Satan does. This is what his very name means. The Satan, the Satan. It means the accuser. And here's what he does. He stands before God and he points his finger and he says, God, you see that Mike Williams? That guy's guilty and he deserves to go to hell. And you know what? He would be right. That is what Satan does. But what Jesus did on the cross was where now he no longer can accuse us. Look at this verse. It has come at last, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, that's Satan, he has been thrown down to the earth. Remember we looked at a verse earlier in John 12, 31 to 32? Jesus said now Satan is going to be cast out. When was it? It was when Jesus gave his life on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. And that's what John, who wrote this book, it's what he's referring to right here. The accuser of our brother, Satan, who accuses all of us of sin and would have been right, but now he's been thrown down. He's been thrown out of heaven. He can't, he can't accuse those who are in a relationship with Jesus anymore. The one who accuses our brother before them day and night 
No longer can Satan point the finger at us because the penalty has been paid. Look at the way Paul said it. Who dares to accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us a right standing. Notice we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. He's given it to us. He's given us a right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died and he was raised to life for us. He's sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand. And notice what he's doing. Jesus is not accusing us. He's pleading for us. Now, unfortunately, sometimes churches and preachers get the reputation, and I hate to say it, but sometimes it's deserved. But sometimes churches get into the, the uh, habit and preachers get into the habit of accusing people and making them feel guilty for everything that they do wrong. And sometimes we think that's what God is like. And we think that's what Jesus is like. And I've used this illustration a bunch of times, and I hate to pick on Wade Ivey. We have a Department of Public Safety uh, sergeant in our, that goes to our church here, and he's a great guy. And he's, one of the, he's not one of the ones that gives out tickets. He's in the canine unit to sniff for you know, drugs and stuff with his dog. But here's what we think about most police personnel and sheriffs and highway patrol. We think they're like this. We think they're like Barney Fife. We think they're cloaking themselves in camouflage and hiding behind bushes or behind a billboard just waiting for you to go one mile an hour over the speed limit. And when you mess up with just the smallest infraction, they're there to give you a ticket and they're glad to do it. A lot of people think that's what God is like and that's what Jesus is like. I want you to know, Jesus isn't like that at all. God's not like that at all. He doesn't want to accuse you. He's pleading for us in God's behalf. And this is a great setup. Think about this. Think about going to court in a situation like this. Your defense attorney, who is what Jesus is. There, there's language in the book of 1 John that calls Jesus your defense attorney. You're on trial and you actually are guilty. We're all guilty of sin. But you're on trial and the defense attorney is there. And guess who the judge is? The judge is the defense attorney's dad. And the defense attorney, Jesus, says to his father, God, they're with me. The judge says, case dismissed. You're good to go. Come on in. You're free. You're not guilty anymore. That's what happens when you're in a relationship with Jesus. And so to kind of sum all this up, I think the Bible's pretty plain about this. We have victory. But because of Christ's victory, because of his cosmic victory that he won over Satan and over the evil beings, because of that, we have victory. We have victory because of what Jesus did. Our victory is a result of Jesus' greater cosmic victory over all these unseen evil beings. And so plainly you can see that there is victory in Jesus as we've already sung about today. But I want you to, to focus on that graphic for a minute. There's victory. Jesus won the victory. He made it available and open for everybody. But unfortunately, not everybody reaps the benefits from it. Because, see, there's victory only if you're in Jesus. He wants to save everybody. He's made the means available to save everybody. But unfortunately, some people continue to persist in unbelief or even if they do intellectually believe in Jesus, they continue to not submit their life to Him. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 37, Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours, but it's only ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. See, it's only when we are in a relationship with Jesus, it's only through Jesus Christ, only then do we have the victory that He won for us. And so as I kind of start wrapping this up, I want everybody to pay real close attention. You've been a great audience, and I appreciate you being here today, but just for a couple of more minutes here, I want you to think about something. <coughs> what are you going to do with this? I mean, is the purpose of Easter Sunday just us gathering together with family and having an Easter egg hunt, having a big meal that many of us are going to go and have after a while? And I'm all, all for all that. There's not a thing in the world wrong with any of that. That's great. And coming to church on Easter Sunday and getting a new Easter dress and some of you are all decked out like you never have been before, nothing wrong with that either. Not a thing in the world wrong with that. 
But if that's all you're going to do with what you know, what good is that really? What good is it? Think about this. I want to ask you a question. Do you want to live forever in a world like this that's characterized by pain and tragedy and suffering and heartache and evil and deception and lying and on and on and on? Do you want to live forever in a world like this? I don't. I'm kind of sick of it. And I bet many of you are too. Unless you submit your life to Jesus, what you're saying is, I'm choosing to continue to live in misery throughout all of eternity in a way that's way worse than this. Submitting to Jesus, he says, I'm going to provide you a world that is literally out of this world. It's crazy good beyond your wildest imagination. And so at this church, what we really try hard to do we don't do it perfectly, as I've illustrated before, because none of us are perfect. But we try really hard to make a big deal out of things the Bible makes a big deal out of. That's why we're making a big deal out of the death and resurrection of Jesus, because that's the number one thing in all of Scripture. The Bible makes a huge deal out of that. There is no salvation without us connecting with the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Here's the problem. There's so much misinformation in our culture today. There's so much information available to us through so many different sources that there's so much misinformation in lots of areas, but especially in the religious area. You get confused. One person tells you one thing, somebody else tells you something else. One preacher says one thing, another one tells you something else. I want everybody to know this. Our church knows this, but I'm a straight shooting preacher. I'm not trying to deceive you. I have no personal benefit in any way to deceive you. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. And at Churches of Christ, many of you probably know, there are certain things that we make a really big deal out of. We make a big deal out of the Lord's Supper. We do this every Sunday. This is not a special thing for us on Easter Sunday. This is not the only Sunday. We do this every single Sunday. Why? Because we think remembering Jesus' death for us, which is what we were doing when we took that bread. He gave his life for us. We're remembering him and we're remembering the blood that he shed for us and his resurrection. We think that's a big deal. And Scripture thinks that's a big deal. That's why we do it every Sunday. We never want to get away from that. And something else we make a big deal out of, which probably you've heard, and I'm not going to apologize for it, is baptism. We make a big deal out of baptism. And some have asked me before, well, why do you make such a big deal out of baptism? Here's why. Because the Bible makes a big deal out of it. Let me show you just one verse. I could literally give you probably 50, but let me show you one. Peter, in this verse, right before this, he's been talking about the time of Noah. We've all heard about that in the book of Genesis, chapter 6 through 9, about Noah's flood. God flooded the whole world, but he saved only those people. There were eight people on that ark. And so he's been talking about this water that was a means of judgment and destruction for people who wouldn't listen to God, but it was also a means of salvation for those who did pay attention to God. And he says this, And that water, that water he's been talking about during Noah's time, is like baptism which now saves you. Baptism is not the washing of dirt from the body. Here's what it is. It's asking God for a clean conscience. And it saves you because Jesus Christ was raised from death. Now let me point out a couple of things there. Especially this little phrase right here. It is asking God for a clean conscience. I'm sure there are some of you who were baptized in here maybe many times, maybe uh, well, one time in the past. Here's what baptism is for. I don't know what your baptism is for or why you did it, but baptism is not to please your mom or your dad or your preacher or your church or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or because everybody else is doing it and you felt pressured to do it. Or it's not because you're, when you're so little you don't know what you're doing and it's done to you. That's not what baptism is. Baptism is you asking God for a clean conscience. God, I know I'm not right with you. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you to save me. Please save me. Some versions say it is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. That's what baptism is. And the reason it saves you is not because somehow when you go through water, it's some magical water. We have a baptistry right behind these nice flowers and this marble thing right here. There's a baptistry back there. It's sink water. 
It's not any holy kind of water. It's water you use for any kind of purpose. The magic is not in the water. The magic is in this. It saves you because Jesus was raised from death. Peter says somehow, and I don't know exactly how, but somehow when you obey God enough to submit to Him in baptism and you go all the way under the water, which is what baptism means, God applies the saving benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection to your life. That's why we make a big deal out of it. And so what I want to ask you on this Easter Sunday, if you really believe Jesus is God's Son, and you have that intellectual knowledge, and you trust that what He did did take care of your sin problem, are you just going to leave it there? Intellectual knowledge? Let me be clear about this. There's a verse in the book of James, and I hope you'll go check me out on this. James is a little letter that one of Jesus' brothers named James wrote towards the uh, end of the New Testament. It comes right after the book of Hebrews, James. It's about six or seven books from the end of the New Testament. And in chapter 2 of that book, I hope you'll go check me out on this. But in chapter 2 of James, James said that the demons believe in Jesus... Meaning, they have intellectual knowledge. They know Jesus is the Son of God. They know He's the Christ and died on the cross. But they're not saved. Intellectual knowledge, agreeing in concept in your mind, is not what saves you. It's when you say, okay, I'm willing to submit to you. I'm willing to obey you. At that point, God applies the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus to your life. So here's what I want everybody to do. I'm going to give you an assignment. I usually don't like people to take out their cell phones during church, but I want you to take yours out right now. That's my cell phone number. I'm actually a preacher who's... I don't tweet. I'm not a tweet, whatever that is. I'm not into that. But you can Facebook message me, but most of us are into this. You can call me or text me at that number. Take your phone out right now. Take a picture of that. Or put it in your contacts or put it in your note on your cell phone or whatever whatever it is you do. And if you have questions about this sermon, there is nothing I would rather do than talk to you about your salvation. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to listen to you. And you can ask me any question you want to ask me. And the question I want to ask you is, are you just going to continue to come to Easter service after Easter service once a year or twice a year, maybe go at Christmas or whatever, and that's it? Or are you going to do something about it? If this sermon, if this message, the words of God had touched your heart and you know, you know that's me. I, I, I just continue to just kind of go with the flow and I don't really change anything. If you know some things need to change and you have questions, you may disagree with everything I said today and that's fine. I would love to sit down and talk with you. Please text me. I promise you, you text me this week, you text me today or tomorrow, whenever, I'll call you back or text you back. In fact, tomorrow morning... Our church knows I'm going to be at my office. I have two offices. One is over here in the church building somewhere. But I have another office, and I'm going to be there tomorrow from 7.30 to 9. Brothers and sisters, where am I going to be? Denny's. Everybody knows. I'm going to be at the local Denny's tomorrow morning. And the purpose of being there is just to welcome people. You can come talk to me about anything. We'll sit there over a cup of coffee, and we'll talk. And I hope some people will. So we're going to sing a song of invitation right now. And if you need to respond to the Lord in any kind of way, you don't have to do it publicly. We're just making that available. But I hope you'll do it in some kind of way. I hope some people will text me this week. So if we can help you or pray for you or encourage you in any kind of way today, let us do that. Let's all stand together while we're singing this song.